Hello everyone and welcome to Evolution 201. So those of you who are in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at the University of Manchester will have done a, a kind of a workshop with me last year that I called Evolution 101. So this is a follow-on for that. Those of you that are in the Faculty of, um, of um, Biology and Medicine, FMBH, um, have covered the same material that was in that workshop in the first year of your degrees. However, if um, you're watching this video and you think um, you don't uh, aren't familiar with some of the concepts I'm about to introduce, I'll put a link in the um, in the summary below this video to, to Evolution 101, just in case you want to use that to brush up on your knowledge of the basics of evolution. So this um, series of video builds on those basics. Um, they have a focus, these videos, on the evolution of morphology and anatomy and kind of evolutionary evolution at this big scale, as well as looking at the processes at play. What we won't be covering in any detail is molecular evolution here. So that's the evolution of our DNA. This is a huge and very exciting field with lots of recent advances. Um, and indeed, many of you may well be doing degrees which have a significant proportion of um, courses which cover the evolution of, of genetics and genomes and other um, such molecular um, topics. For those of you that don't, I will remember to put some resources in the bonus s section at the bottom that cover the, some of the basics of, um, the, of molecular evolution in case you're interested in learning about it. So that's this series of video, and this particular video um, looks at the history of evolution and uh, makes sure that we're all on the same page. So what is evolution? This is what we covered um, in the first year, or is covered in Evolution 101, if you want to, to watch that, if this is news to you. Um, but I just want to highlight, so we're on the same page, that for a trait to undergo change through time, it must be heritable, so it can be passed between generations, and it must vary in a population. Studies of DNA suggest that there is significant genetic variation in populations, much of which is caused by mutation, and that this filters through to the morphology of organisms. When organisms within a population uh, vary in their reproductive success, i.e. more are born than can survive, this heritability matters. And it's through that the, the, um, the resulting struggle for existence that natural selection happens. And because of this, evolution occurred, occurs. So the example that I used for evolution 101, or one of them anyway, was these peppered moths where there were dark colored, melanistic and light colored non-melanistic forms. In unpolluted environments, um, these dark colored forms, which were caused by genetic mutation, were more likely to be spotted by predators and therefore were not very common. As in the Industrial Revolution, things got more and more polluted. Um, those, in turn, became a larger and larger proportion or makeup of the population of these moths was these melanistic, these dark colored forms. And so this was an example of evolution in action through the Industrial Revolution. So that's what was covered in the first video. Sorry, by first video, I guess I mean the, the first um, session that we did on this. So do feel free to catch up on that if you so wish. I think it's always worth looking at why these things are important. And, and I guess in this case, Evolution is important biologically because it led to the biodiversity that we see around today. The process by which um, the biodiversity that's around today continues to change and to respond to, um, for example, climatic change. And this is true all the way from, say, cnidarians, the sea anemones shown here, through to cephalopods and other more, quote unquote, complex organisms whether that's a valid thing to say or not, is, I think, a philosophical discussion for another time. But essentially, um, I, in terms of biology, refer you to this quote that I used previously in Evolution 101 by Theo Dobzhansky, that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Geologically, though, 
evolution is really important because it defines how the Earth life system has evolved. So evolution has fundamentally altered the Earth, shown on the right here in two very, very different forms. There's the Earth as we, as we typically see it. Here is the Earth from the edge of the solar system. And evolution has fundamentally altered the Earth in many, many ways. To name just three of those, we can thank evolution for the oxygen that's present in the atmosphere. In evolutionary milestones, we talk about the great oxygenation event, which gives you more details on that. We will um, be learning how, in the terrestrialization videos, changes in plants have led to a shift from typically braided river morphologies through to meandering rivers. So that's another fundamental shift in how water travels across the surface of our continents. And there are many examples of fundamental changes in geochemical cycles thanks to the start of um, the Cambrian explosion and through burrowing, mixing up layers of the sediment. So all in all, life has fundamentally altered the um, chemistry uh, and the, the processes that are present on Earth. Given its importance, it's not surprising that there is a wealth of history surrounding the development of the ideas that we will now call evolution. This, of course, could be a lecture in and of itself, and I'm just going to touch on a few points um, which are relatively important in the history of the theory of evolution. If you want uh, a more thorough history of evolutionary thought, this um, paper by or chapter of a book, I should say, by Ruse and Travis, which is available in the University of Manchester for our students, is a very good place to look. So in the world of ancient, the ancient Greeks, like Plato and Aristotle, shown on the left here, there was no place for significant developmental processes or ongoing incremental organic change in the worldview of many of the major philosophers. So, for example, Plato and Aristotle viewed the world as showing order and intention, and thus believed this could not have appeared through a blind, ungoverned process of law. Of course, there's a lot of baggage associated with those words blind and ungoverned, which we won't get into. But nevertheless, that was the per, um, pervasive view at the time. Slightly later than this, uh, Jews and early Christians were inclined to reject ideas of evolution as it didn't sit easily alongside the Genesis creation stories. It's worthy of note, though, that even early in the history of Christianity, religion was not an absolute bar to um, the belief in and the study of evolution. If you want to learn more about this, maybe, for example, look up St. Augustine or Thomas Aquinas, shown in the Aquinas, sorry, I should say, shown in the middle here. And from the 8th to the 13th centuries, the Islamic world was a hotbed of important scholastic endeavours. Uh, in the second paper I've put below here by Malik et al. from 2018, uh, these authors uh, highlight that there were a number of Muslim scholars, the example I've shown on the right here is al-Biruni, who, who is from um, what is now Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan, and these scholars postulated evolutionary ideas that included ideas similar to, that could be mapped to, adaptation, survival of the fittest, the origin of humans from apes or monkeys, the occurrence of extinctions, and hereditary variability. So, historically, there's quite a few precursors to um, the kind of the advent of what we may consider, I guess, modern evolutionary studies. And I should highlight that science in general underwent a number of changes during a period that we tend to call the Age of Enlightenment. This is a philosophical movement uh, which dominated the world of ideas in Europe in the 18th century. Um, it's based on the use of reason uh, as a source of authority, uh, which is in part alluded to by this image on the left-hand side here. Uh, Enlightenment scholars uh, you know, followed evidence and science, and there were a series of ideals associated with this movement, such as liberty and tolerance, which I think are quite nicely summed up by the Voltaire quotes you can see at the bottom here. So uh, a choice one is, those who can make us believe in absurdities can make you commit atrocities. So I think... Um, 
This is kind of the beginning of many uh, of the attitudes that we still hold today, and certainly many of the ways that we have of working in science today, such as um, the publication of uh, science through papers. This was, was born out of the Enlightenment. Meetings and education typically occurred in coffee houses, interestingly. So uh, a notorious one of the time is shown in the background of this middle image here. And I think it's worth noting that the USA is essentially an Enlightenment society. The founding fathers, shown here, um, signing the Declaration of Independence, were essentially Enlightenment scholars, and the US Constitution is an Enlightenment document. And it was in this time period where the roots of modern evolutionary thought really lie. Three um, important players, as it were, who set the scene for our understanding of evolution today are shown here. Hutton, shown on the left, was a Scottish gentleman farmer, so he was part of the Scottish Enlightenment. In the early 1750s, he moved to a lowland farm he had inherited um, from his family, possibly because he got someone pregnant. It's kind of hard to tell um, this from the, uh, the the remaining documents that are around, um, and this was his way of avoiding that responsibility. Um, but either way, he went to this farm and took to observing soil and rocks, and he suggested a theory called uniformitarianism. So this is a um, feature, or this suggests, sorry, that features of the Earth's crust um, evolve by means of natural processes over long, long periods of what we would now recognise as geological time. So long periods of time, and the processes that are occurring today um, have occurred uh, over, over a very long period of time. He also suggested some elements that we may actually recognise as uh, being um, aligned with the theory of evolution by natural um, selection, um, but the kind of the recognition of this was stymied by his writing style. I'll try and remember to put an example of, of just one of those phrases at the bottom of this page in the, that you're watching this on in the bonus material so you can see what I mean. I think there's a useful lesson to learn here. Essentially, James Hutton was so bad at writing that even though he came up with a number of very important ideas, relatively few of those, or, or many of them, did not actually stick because no one actually read his works because it was so hard to, to um, keep on top of. We can compare his ideas with a, a vague contemporary, which is, um, which is uh, Georges Cuvier, shown on the right-hand side here. Now, this is a gentleman that um, is covered in the extinction lectures as well because he um, was the person that revealed extinction of species and, and established that as a process. In this light, um, he suggested that extinctions could be due to periodic catastrophic floods. Um, and this led to uh, an idea that he was a, a strong advocate of, of catast catastrophism. That's not quite the word I'm looking for. Anyway, he believed that catastrophes were commonly occurring and painted this as very much uh, opposing this idea of uniformitarianism, that things had always been the same. In, in his worldview, things would um, happen with, uh, with pulsed changes. Interestingly, I think it's worth noting that he did not believe in any form of evolution. So those two kind of were seen as opposing uh, views at the time. In the middle here is Charles Lyell. Now, he was a British lawyer that was best known as a, a geologist in the Victorian era, and his work was very important in popularising Hutton's concept of uniformitarianism, at a time when Cuvier's ideas were far more prominent. He also influenced many prominent thinkers, including Darwin. And this shift towards the recognition that uh, there is deep time and that processes that are happening today happened in the past very much opens the door for the ideas of evolution to develop uh, and so for, for forces that are happening today to occur over a long period of time, explaining, for example, the origin of species. So this helped promote the idea of an ancient earth as opposed to this idea of catastrophism of Cuvier. So it's these, the, these ideas are central to the development of the theory of evolution. Two other people that were central to that idea are these two English Victorian gentlemen who came up with the idea of evolution, importantly, through natural selection. 
They're very, very different people. On the left, you can see Charles Darwin, who was from a wealthy family. His father was a wealthy society donor, and his mother was a member of the Wedgwood family, who are very, very um, wealthy thanks to their pottery works. Wallace, Alfred Russell Wallace, shown on the right here, was from more modest means. He was a surveyor for a time and then a schoolmaster. So Darwin had a, a famously a, a voyage uh, on the boat the Beagle between 1831 and 1836 and based on his observations in that um, voyage he came up with some of the ideas that we now recognize as natural selection so for example he drew this tree that's shown here in 1837 and came up with the uh, theory of evolution by natural selection around this time but possibly in deference to his wife's religious sensibilities, and possibly out of fear for society's reactions to this idea, he spent many years, instead of publishing that, just working on and publishing um, monographs on barnacles. He loved barnacles. In 1848, uh, Alfred Russell Wallace went travelling to Brazil, hoping to fa fund this, um, this voyage by selling the specimens he collected. So this was his first foray into doing something scientific. However, um, the ship with his specimens on sunk on the way back to the UK in 1852, and all of them were lost. Thankfully, I suppose, Alfred Russell Wallace had insurance, which he lived off for 18 months, and then from 1854 to 1862, he travelled around Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, and collected more than 126,000 specimens. During an attack of fever in 1858, in a fevered dream, he came up with this idea of natural selection. It was like, oh, this seems like a good idea. So when he realised this may be a good idea, he wrote to Darwin, who had been sitting on his theory by this point for quite a significant length of time. Darwin wasn't sure what to do, so he asked Charles Lyell and a gentleman named Joseph Hooker for advice. And that duo presented Wallace's essay, or his letter, without his permission, because it takes a long time for post to travel um, during this period, along with two unpublished excerpts from Darwin's writings on the theory of evolution to a meeting of the, Linnea the Linnaean Society in London on the 1st of July 1858. So this was really the beginning of this idea of, um, of evolution by natural selection. I notice it wasn't immediately popular though. Thomas Bell, who was the president of the Linnaean Society at the time, said in his annual address for the year 1858, the year which has passed has not indeed been marked by any of those striking discoveries which had once revolutionized, so to speak, so to speak the department of science on which they bear. So at least at the end of 1858, the head of the Linnaean Society didn't really believe that this was a particularly noteworthy um, kind of contribution uh, to science, which I think is, I think, very interesting. And Darwin then published his book on the origin of species in 1859, and things generally took off from there. I've put at the bottom here just a quote from um, Alfred Russell Wallace, which I really like, where which I think tells you a lot about the gentleman, where he says that he um, he when he is catching a butterfly, uh, none but a naturalist can understand the intense excitement I experienced when at length I captured the butterfly. On taking it out of my net and opening the glorious wings, my heart began to beat violently. The blood rushed to my head and I felt more like fainting than I have done when in apprehension of immediate death. I had a headache the rest of the day. So great was the excitement produced by what will appear to most people a very inadequate cause. So that, I think, paints a, a very charming picture of Alfred Russell Wallace. He seems like a nice gentleman that was really enthusiastic and keen about what he did. And that brings us to the end of video number one. In the next video, we'll be looking at some of the philosophy surrounding evolution and it's a tiny bit about its modern day study. So I hope you'll join me there on video number two. I'll see you shortly.